Hi everyone, today we're going to start the first lecture in a series of lectures about viruses. First thing to mention about viruses is that there are a lot of them. There are lots of viruses in the world. Uh, this is from a really nice review about viruses in the world, showing that in terms of biomass, bacteria and archaea are much more abundant in the global ocean then protists. Protists is a somewhat antiquated word for single-celled uh, microbial eukaryotes. And viruses, although by mass, according to this estimate, there are actually more grams of viruses in the ocean than there are grams of microbial eukaryotes, which is pretty impressive. <clears throat> and this is in the ocean because the ocean is nice and homogenous, so if you do a count of one milliliter, then you can nicely extrapolate to the rest of the liters of the ocean. It's a lot harder to do that with soil or other kinds of environments. And also the ocean is really big, so it's, it's a good thing to use for these kinds of estimates. But in terms of numbers of particles, viruses are definitely the winner. Um, they outnumber bacteria and archaea by orders of magnitude. And I've used this slide before to show um, the concept of transduction, which is the transfer of DNA by viruses. And to mention that because there are so many viruses in the ocean, uh, and there are so many bacteria and archaea in the ocean, that someone has estimated that there are 10 to the 23 viral infections every second in the ocean. That's a large number. Uh, and um, that if you stacked all of the ocean's viruses end to end, and keep in mind, each virus is very, very small. Uh, they would stretch back, they would stretch um, past the nearest 60 galaxies. So not just to the end of our own solar system, not just to the end of our own galaxy, not just to the next galaxy, but past the next 60 galaxies. I don't even know how to think about that except that there are a lot of viruses in the ocean. We are, of course, all familiar with the idea that sometimes when some viruses infect us, then we get sick. Here are just a few of the many illnesses caused by viruses. Um, but what I want to focus on, at least for this lecture, is that this is actually the rare case. Um, most viruses do not make us sick, and most of the time when viruses infect us, um, illness is not the consequence. There are lots of different potential outcomes. Um, so one possibility is that yes, there's a, a negative effect on the host by a viral infection. Very often there's no effect at all, at least um, uh, not immediately and sometimes never. The virus just infects the host and there it sits and maybe nothing happens. Um, a virus infection can actually have a beneficial uh, effect. So there's the example of some aphids when they are infected by viruses they're actually better able to colonize a new plant. Um, cholera is caused by the bacterium Vibrio cholera, which is very common in the ocean. And um, it normally does not produce the toxin that causes cholera when it infects people. But when it's infected by a particular virus, then it becomes capable of uh, making the toxin and colonizing a host gut. So it's really the, the, the phage and the bacterium working together to cause cholera. So uh, with respect to the virus and the bacterium, it's a mutualistic relationship. Of course, it's not mutualistic for humans. Phage, by the way, is the word used for viruses that infect bacteria. Uh, for a while, it wasn't clear that phage and viruses were actually the same thing, but now we know that phages are simply viruses that infect bacteria and archaea. Um, there are also examples of uh, kind of indirect evolutionary relationships with viruses and their hosts, some of which you could even call symbiotic. So there's the famous example of the retroviral gene that was incorporated into the human genome and then later became used uh, during the evolution of mammals to form a membrane, um, uh, <clears throat> a, a tissue that, that separates the maternal and fetal bloodstreams in the placenta, which originally came from this protein uh, that was, uh, the, the gene for which was inserted into the human genome by a retrovirus that had infected humans and inserted its genome into the human genome. And then over time, it was repurposed for this uh, development of the, of the human placenta. So we can thank viruses for our placentas. Um, this is a great story. If you wanna read more, um, I highly recommend it. Uh, here's a more straightforward example of a beneficial effect of a viral infection. There are some plants that, when infected by a virus, 
they are more resistant to drought. So here's the schematic showing that in the absence of the viral infection, uh, drought is causes uh, stress in the plant and doesn't do so well. When it does have the viral infection, it does well um, when subjected to drought. So here's a, a link to this review article. Uh, check it out if you want to learn more about that. So let's talk a little bit more explicitly about the viruses themselves. Those were a few examples of the diversity of outcomes of a viral infection. The viruses themselves are also very diverse, and um, and there's viruses in general are are so diverse, and very few people really appreciate just how different two viruses can be. So first of all, their genomes can be linear or circular. Um, just like uh, bacteria and archaea tend to have circular genomes and eukaryotes have linear chromosomes, um, viruses have both of those options and more, more than that. Um, the genome can be DNA or RNA. The DNA can be double-stranded or it can be single-stranded DNA. Um, you may not even realize there is such a thing as single-stranded DNA, but there is. They, it forms the genome of some viruses. Uh, the RNA can be single-stranded RNA or double-stranded RNA. Again, I bet you didn't know there was such a thing as a double-stranded RNA genome, but there are some viruses that have double-stranded RNA genomes. Uh, some viruses are very tiny. Some are bigger than maybe you'd expect. I'll show an example in a minute. Um, some viruses are very species-specific. For a long time, um, there was kind of an assumption that viruses were species-specific, and now it's becoming more and more appreciated that many, maybe most, maybe nearly all viruses can infect multiple species, and some can infect many, many, many different kinds of species. And we are all living through an example of that right now. <clears throat> uh, more pictures of the ways that viruses come in different shapes and sizes. They can come in long rods, like this virus that infects tobacco plants because it infects tobacco. A lot of money went into studying it. Um, the virus that causes cold looks like this. Um, the, the bacteriophage is the virus that infects um, bacteria, very commonly used in the lab. It looks like a moon lander with a head and a, and a landing gear. Um, these are some more weird shapes of uh, bacteria. They're, the, uh, of, of viruses that infect bacteria. And viruses that infect archaea seem to be especially oddly shaped. There are lemon-shaped viruses. There are uh, champagne bottles with antennae. <laughs> there are these uh, kind of uh, hexagon-shaped viruses. There are super, super long filament vi viruses. Um, like all, lots of different shapes, not just uh, diversity in genome, but also diversity in morphology. Uh, diversity in size, uh, the Pandora virus can be up to one and a half microns in length. That's larger than a lot of bacterial and archaeal cells. This is like a proper cell-sized particle. So large that for a long time it was not even recognized as a virus. And even now its status as a virus is not exactly in question, but it has been proposed as potentially a missing link. Uh, air quotes, because I don't really like that phrase, missing link, but um, it's been proposed as a missing link between viruses and cells. Uh, it certainly has features of both cells and viruses, so it's it's really intriguing in that way. This graph is showing genome sizes, um, so not only is it large, but it also has a large genome. Uh, so these um, or these these uh, bars are showing the range in genome size in terms of number of bases in millions for archaea, bacteria, carrots, and viruses. So archaea and bacteria have genomes that are usually in a few million of bases. Eukaryotes, including us, can have very, very large genomes. Uh, viruses in general have very small genomes, but some of them are quite large. So there's a, a healthy overlap here between the sizes of some very large viral genomes and the genomes of bacteria and archaea. Um, even uh, some Pandora's, Pandora virus genomes are larger than the smallest eukaryotic genomes. Right? So there, there's a, there's a um, a kind of a, a gray area here of, uh, not, not exactly a gray area, but there's, there's a really wide range in characteristics of viruses. They're very diverse. <laughs> uh, really cool Radiolab episode um, about the Pandora virus here. Um, a classic science story from Radiolab here about giant viruses. Highly recommended. Let's talk a little bit more about how amazingly diverse viruses are. I really like this image. It's 
uh, extremely overwhelming, um, which is one reason why I like it, because it, in one image, gives a sense of the diversity of viruses. So first of all, it's uh, divided up between RNA and DNA viruses, and it shows some examples of uh, um, single-strand viruses and double-strand RNA viruses. Uh, double-stranded RNA viruses um, split into positive and negative strand um, RNA viruses, single-strand DNA viruses, double-strand DNA viruses, as I mentioned before. Um, I'm not going to go into their molecular mechanisms, but they do have a little schematic here showing how they replicate and infect, and showing how, depending on whether you start with RNA or DNA, single-stranded or double-stranded, your replication cycle is going to be a bit different. And these pictures show um, which kingdoms of life these viruses infect, so positive-strand RNA viruses, which include coronaviruses and rhinoviruses, which cause the common cold, infect basically everything. They, of course, infect metazoans, that's what MZ stands for, and microbial eukaryotes and plants and bacteria. Um, some viruses so far have only been discovered to infect um, metazoans and plants. For example, influenza and Ebola, HIV infects metazoans and fungi. Um, sorry, that's not... That's, uh, uh, retroid RNA viruses infect metazoans and fungi, and HIV is one example of a retroid RNA virus that infects uh, metazoans, uh, primates specifically, and so on. So here are just a few examples of viruses you may have heard of, and to show, for example, how coronaviruses and influenza viruses are both RNA viruses, but they are in very different classes within the broad group of RNA viruses, coronaviruses being positive strand and influenza viruses being negative strand. And that might sound like a subtle difference, but um, it actually has really big consequences for how they reproduce and replicate and evolve. So coronaviruses, for example, because their genomes are encoded in positive strand RNA virus, positive strand RNA basically means the same as the messenger RNA. So it, for example, can be translated directly into protein. So you, the genome inside the coronavirus particle can be just immediately converted to protein by the host cell, whereas a negative strand RNA genome first has to be transcribed into a positive strand and then translation can occur. Again, sounds subtle, but has profound uh, implications and these are really completely different kinds of viruses uh, for that reason. So all this is to say that viruses are very diverse. Um, in fact, they're so diverse that there is no single trait that is common to all viruses. There's a definition out there about viruses, um, which is something like they are composed of genetic material, which could be DNA or RNA, that is enclosed in some kind of compartment, which can be protein or lipid. Uh, so that's basically the best we can do in terms of a definition that would fit all of the viruses that we know about. Um, even so, some viruses come pretty close to not fitting that definition. Uh, and I think it really highlights how there is no uh, homology among all of the known viruses. Uh, in other words, they are not monophyletic. And because they are not monophyletic, it's possible that all of the viruses in the world are not the same thing. They do not have a common ancestor, most likely, and it seems like they have evolved multiple times. And these different kinds of viruses have probably evolved independently of each other. And eventually we should probably invent different words uh, to describe them instead of using the word virus to describe all of them. Um, I think pretty soon the word virus will, will lose any evolutionary meaning, if it hasn't already. Um, a practical consequence of this is that there's no such thing as an antiviral in the same way that we have antibiotics, that mostly um, some antibiotics anyway kill most bacteria. Uh, there's no, no equivalent for viruses. All of the antiviral compounds that we have are highly specific to very specific strains of viruses. Usually when the virus evolves, then you got to come up with a new antiviral. Um, th there's no antiviral, there's no broad spectrum, sorry, there's no broad spectrum antiviral. Um, there's no such thing because there's no common trait among all the viruses. There's, so there's um, just in principle, it would not be possible to, to kill all viruses with one drug. I mean, the, maybe the best you could do is to come up with a, um, a, an RNA virus antiviral and a DNA virus antiviral, but even then, um, I'm not aware of, of any such thing that, that works, um, that, that really works at all. Um, so let's think a little more about the um, potentially profound consequences of this idea that viruses are not monophyletic. Uh, 
Uh, so where do they come from? And so first of all, as I just said, uh, different kinds of viruses may have a different answer to this question. But um, three possibilities that I'm aware of um, are listed here. First one being the virus first hypothesis, which means that all of life today evolved from something that looked like a virus. Um, this has um, uh, a lot of intuitive appeal because we think of viruses as being simple and we must have all evolved from something that is simpler than we are. Uh, but I think that if you think about it more than that, it doesn't really work anymore because viruses are pretty inherently infectious particles and you can't really infect anything if you're the first thing around, right? So uh, if the virus first hypothesis is correct, then that means that the infectious nature of the viruses must have evolved later, right? They couldn't have been inherently infectious at the beginning because there was nothing to infect if they were the first thing. Um, still, that's an important idea to think about. Uh, second one is that viruses have uh, devolved. That's not really a correct word to use because evolution doesn't have a direction, right? But in this context, the idea is that they are the descendants of real cells. So an archaeal or bacterial or eukaryotic cell was um, subject to selection pressures that caused it to become uh, parasitic, and then it became more and more and more parasitic until finally it became a virus. And so in this uh, idea, the virus is kind of the end state of an extremely parasitic cell. Um, so one prediction is that some of the bacterial parasites that we know about today might one day become something more like a virus. Um, I like that idea. I don't think there's really strong evidence of any examples of that, however. Um, maybe we just need to study them more. The third option is that viruses are components of cells that escaped from their um, cell of origin to become a parasite. So this is similar to the, the idea number two, but the difference is that it's not the whole cell with its genome and everything that evolved into a parasite, but that the cell had some component of it, like a gene or a, um, a compartment within the cell that somehow captured a gene that then went rogue and escaped from the host cell to become its own separate entity. So I hope you can see how that's distinct from the second option where the whole species actually evolves into being a virus. Instead, a virus kind of escaped from the host. Uh, the third one seems to have the most support right now. It seems really popular. I think it makes sense. There's some really cool studies in cell biology that seems consistent with that idea. There are all sorts of weird um, little compartments and uh, blobs and blebs within cells that seem like they could become um, uh, independently infectious particles, especially if they captured a gene so that they would have some hereditary aspect. Um, I can point you to some papers on that if you want to learn more about that. Um, for now, I just want to highlight that all three of these options are viable and different viruses could um, fit into each of these differently. There is no need to have a single answer for all viruses. Um, here is a, um, a wacky uh, paper that attempts to explain the origin of all kinds of viruses. And I mention it here because it um, embraces this, this idea that different viruses might have different origins and proposes a highly detailed uh, scenario in which different kinds of ribosomes and, um, sorry, different kinds of viruses and also things like ribozymes, uh, which are um, self-replicating RNA molecules and uh, group one introns, which are kind of like selfish genes that jump around and different kinds of RNA and DNA viruses and plasmids, um, retrons, um, how all of these kinds of uh, uh, replicating genetic entities might have arisen during evolution, some of which might have arisen during the RNA world before we even had cells. So that would be answer number one on the previous slide. Some of them uh, uh, escaped from, from cells as in uh, answer number three on the previous slide. So if you wanna jump into these ideas um, I recommend this paper. Uh, I don't think even the author of this paper would uh, claim that any of these ideas are necessarily correct, but it's a really fun um, uh, um, exploration of these different ideas. Okay, so 
if we're going to talk about where did viruses come from, then we might as well talk about are viruses alive? I get this question all the time, and my answer, I think, is almost always disappointing because I don't think there is an answer to this question. Uh, you'll get different answers if you ask different biologists. When I teach Biology 1620, um, we instructors always get into a fight about what we're going to tell students <laughs> about this question. Uh, so here's my answer. Uh, First of all, there are a lot of things that viruses don't do that we think life should do. So they don't respire, that is, they don't do any kind of metabolic activity inside the viral particle. They depend on the metabolic activity of the host cell. They don't move on their own. Um, they don't grow on their own. They don't do any kind of energy production. That's another way of saying they don't have any metabolism. Uh, they don't do anything unless they are infecting another organism. And that seems to be the key. Uh, the counterpoint to that is that there are a lot of bacteria and archaea and eukaryotes out there that also don't really do anything unless they're infecting another organism. So um, lots of fun counterpoints to these ideas, but those points are still valid and, and still stand. Um, uh, so some, some points in favor of saying that they are alive, they most certainly do reproduce. Um, they can only reproduce with the help of a host, but again, some, some things that we think are alive are fall into that category as well. They definitely evolve. Uh, lots of things evolve that may not be alive, however, so um, depending on how you define evolve, that's its own um, big debate. Um, <clears throat> but certainly viruses, uh, there's no debate, undergo Darwinian evolution. Uh, they have a lineage. You can trace the lineages of viruses. You can make phylogenies of specific groups of viruses. I said you can't make a phylogeny of all viruses, but you most certainly can make a phylogeny of groups of viruses that do share homologous traits and especially genes. Um, they are independent in that they're not limited to a single organism or a single species. So viruses that can infect multiple kinds of species, there's some independence inherent to that. So they're not tied to a single single species. Uh, and the reason why I uh, kind of dismiss this question and, and say I don't really have an answer to it is because in some ways it doesn't really matter. Like it can be fun to talk about these ideas and what we think is or is not alive, but it's clear that viruses are important, right? So some biologists get annoyed by this question because if the answer is no, they're not alive, then some people are worried that the next thought is, oh, well, if they're not alive, then we don't need to worry about them. That's obviously not true. Like they're obviously important whether we decide that they fit our definition of alive or not. Um, they certainly, and not only important, but obviously biologically important. Okay, so this is kind of the overview. Like, I don't think any biologists, any biologists would really uh, disagree with anything on this slide. And so now this slide is my personal answer. So my personal answer is that if you want me to tell you if something is alive, you're going to have to give me a definition of life. Um, the most popular definition of life that you'll often see in textbooks is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. And I think there's no doubt that a virus fits that definition. Um, the only problem is whether you think a virus is self-sustaining or not. And that's when you, you get into the ideas that I talked about on the previous slide. Uh, um, I, uh, my, my personal answer on this is that I'm not satisfied with this definition. Um, if you dig into the origin of this particular definition, uh, the people who came up with this definition never... <clears throat> The people who came up with this definition never thought that this should be considered the final and fully accepted definition of life. Um, it was one attempt they, that they proposed at one time, and somehow it became enshrined as the definition of life. Uh, but we probably shouldn't think about it that way. And it does open up, what exactly does self-sustaining mean? Um, because humans are not self-sustaining, um, because we depend on basically everything on this planet to support our lifestyle. So. Um, yeah, I, I'm not satisfied by that definition, and so I, I, I'm hesitant to use that as my sole metric for whether a virus is alive, alive or not. Uh, my favorite thing that I've ever read on this topic is this philosophy paper about the theory of life, um, where they point out that um, we didn't have a definition of water for a long time um, because we didn't have atomic theory. So we called lots of different things water back in the old days before we knew about atoms. Like uh, nitric acid was called aqua fortis, strong water, because nitric acid looked like water, it behaved like water, it just behaved a little bit differently than water, so we called it strong water. 
right? And that's because we didn't know about molecules. We didn't know about atoms. And once we had atomic theory, then we could define water as H2O. Defining water as H2O would have been completely incomprehensible to people who were living at a time before they knew about atoms, right? And so in this philosophy paper, they propose that we're at the same stage now with respect to life, that we don't have a theory um, that explains life. We, we need more examples of life from other planets, for example, or some kind of major biological discoveries that give us a more fundamental understanding of what it means to be alive. And then maybe we can have some kind of theory of life and what it means to be alive. And then from a theory, we can derive a definition. So my answer is, I don't think we know what life is. Um, so I can't tell you if viruses are alive or not, because I don't know what life is. I think what we do know about are cells. I think we have a really well-developed theory of biological cells. We know what a cell is, we know what is not a cell, and we can say that viruses are not cells. So I think that's a pretty helpful answer, honestly, to say that viruses are different than cells. Archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotes are um, present as cells. Viruses are not archaea, bacteria, or eukaryotes, and they are not cells. I think that's a pretty big um, observation already, and they certainly play a part in biological organisms and biological communities and biological evolution. So I think of them as fascinating biological particles. And whether they're alive or not, again, I think that means they're just highlighting our need for a better theory of life. Okay, that's my spiel on the topic. People ask me about it all the time, so I hope you enjoyed listening to it, and we can talk about it in class if you like. All right, um, see you then. Bye.